you know, as people understand these mechanisms and these markers in their own life, it's going to give them so much empowerment. I think it's really important to be able to track all of your data, but um, I think something that's really important is being able to empower people to make different health decisions based on what they're seeing in their data. Not only just take care and optimize our own personal health, but what does that mean to the community of people that we're around? Right. Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. Okay, Michelle Darian, great to be with you today on this Friday afternoon. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so excited too, um, to talk about biomarkers. And um, I'm going to set uh, the stage for our conversation with uh, a little analogy that I like to use. So most everyone is familiar with a dashboard in their car, which provides a window into some of the essential vital metrics and mechanism of your vehicle's functionality. So there's oil pressure and tire pressure, there's a gas gauge, a temperature gauge, a speedometer, et cetera. And when there's a problem, like the engine light goes on, um, generally you respond to address that problem. Maybe you're handy and you can fix it yourself, but you know, generally you want to take it into the shop. So a significant part of your work and um, the work at Inside Tracker is uh, providing people with, with a health dashboard into their own personal vehicle. And, um, and like a car, the human organism has systems that need to cooperate and work together to ensure optimal functionality. In connection to this, there are specific important metrics that now um, in, our, in this era of agency, we can examine to determine uh, and get a window into the health of our vehicle. So, and these metrics are known as biomarkers. So um, now there's a, a lot of biomarkers that we could look at. And recently a phlebotomist actually came to my house and took some uh, took a, a blood sample, and then Inside Tracker sent me an analysis of um, of up to basically forty three different markers that that you could look at at least through the Inside Tracker service. Um, and so, for the sake of our conversation today, you've whittled it down to um, to ten of the most important biomarkers. So we're going to examine why these markers are so important the optimal range for these markers and some behaviors that we can adopt uh, to get these markers into an optimal range if they happen not to be. So I'll just start before we get into the specific markers. Why did you choose these 10 specific markers that we're going to talk about today? Yeah, I chose the uh, 10 specific markers. So, um, you know, all 43 are important for overall health and kind of the combination of all of them and how they play together. But I would say these 10 are the most important um, just kind of for a broad range of different health reasons. So uh, they're correlated with optimal bone strength, with longevity, um, with um, better per athletic performance or a number of different things and even just vitality. So um, I would say the curated list that we're going to kind of chat through today are some of those highlights for a number of different, um, for more like more of a holistic view of overall health. Yeah. And I know that you've written a lot about longevity and about the difference between health span and lifespan. So, you know, we have this lifespan in the United States, which is actually gone down over the last uh, few years. Um, but more important, it seems, than lifespan is health span. So um, what we see in the United States with the prevalence of chronic disease is, you know, people in their early 60s um, start to develop, you know, cardiovascular disease or diabetes or dementia, neurodegenerative diseases, um, you know, uh, proclivity for stroke, etc., and they spend the last 16 years on a cocktail of pharmaceuticals trying to uh, address uh, a multiplicity of chronic diseases. So one thing I love about being able to have services like Inside Tracker and to be able to look at our biomarkers is that we can get ahead of this because so many of these chronic diseases are progressive, right? They happen over 
a long period of time. Right. Um, and uh, and so when I read, you know, some of the stuff that you when that you're writing about, yeah, you're focused about longevity, but you're also very focused on increasing health span and not just lifespan, right? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And it's such um, there's so many differentiating factors there, even between just health span and lifespan, um, because it's great that if lifespan and life expectancy, it's great that research and science has allowed kind of that number to go up. I mean, obviously, with kind of the exception of the last couple of years, but um, to your point, it's so important to be able to increase health span, which is like the number of healthy years or the number of years that you spend in good health before um, some of those age related processes start to take over. Um, so it's, yeah, it's definitely really important to kind of target both of those, especially with, um, different recommendations and interventions. And I think it's, um, the analogy that you started with, um, with the car and kind of, and how you like are used to repairing it and trying to fix it and things like that, I think is such a great analogy, I think for health span as well. So just kind of being proactive and being able to take that into your own control. So yeah, important. nobody would drive a car without a dashboard. Yet oh, of course. plenty of people seem to be quite content to to walk around with no window into their own into the metrics of their own health. So that's what we're gonna um get into today. So let's start with a hormone that has been much discussed, particularly during COVID, and this is vitamin D. So Michelle, why are vitamin D levels so important? Yeah, that's a great one to start with. So um, I think vitamin D has gotten a ton of recent attention due to its um, due to its role in the immune system. So um, it definitely has a lot of immune effects. So we know that it can um, help with immune, like help to disrupt immunosenescence, uh, which is the kind of the gradual decline of the immune system. Um, we also know that it ha- plays a role in different respiratory tract infections, and actually having optimal levels um, can help to reduce that risk. Um, but I would say uh, vitamin D is, is be- most known for its relationship with bone health. So basically, vitamin D is um, is very helpful for the absorption of calcium, um, which is important for your bone mineral density. And having optimal bone mineral density is important for a number of different factors. So um, for the aging population, um, for it, and to it can help to decrease the risk of stress fractures or um, falls, things like that. Um, it can also be helpful for an athletic population who um, is basically more prone to kind of a stress fracture. So I would say um, that's kind of where vitamin D was the most, I would say the most popular right now, and then maybe is um, kind of most commonly heard about. Um, but it's so interesting that vitamin D plays a number of roles in a ton of other processes as well. So uh, we know it's related to longevity. Um, it's related to mood. It's even related to um, improvements in sleep and kind of optimizing that sleep, your optimal sleep duration and sleep quality. Um, and even with testosterone levels and cholesterol levels, there's a correlation there between having optimal vitamin D and having optimal levels of other biomarkers that um, we'll touch on today too. So um, I kind of like to say that vitamin D, if, if there's a process in your, in your body, that it, vitamin D probably plays a role in it. Yeah. And so I'd love to talk about optimal vitamin D levels, because from the data that I've seen, the percentage of people that are deficient in vitamin D is just staggering and on a global basis. So, and this is somewhat related to latitudes, right? Because your body can produce endogenously can produce vitamin D endogenously if it's exposed to UVB, ultraviolet B radiation from the sun, right? Um, so can you kind of unpack that a little bit? I mean, how, what are some of the optimal ranges? Why are we so deficient? You know, how important is getting out in the sun and is that sufficient or should we be supplementing or eating specific kind of diet for vitamin D? Help us, help us understand that. Yeah, that's a really great, a lot of really great points. So I think it's interesting. And even um, with all the recent attention that vitamin D has gotten, I think it's staggering that still 40% um, of Americans um, that get their vitamin D tested are still deficient in vitamin D. Um, So it's really interesting. So I think something that I hear so commonly Um, especially just as a dietitian, I hear, oh, I'm so surprised that my vitamin D is so low because I spend so much time in the sun. 
Um, but it's interesting. So the sun is helpful for producing or helping the body to naturally produce vitamin D on its own, but it's interesting. So vitamin D can help you to kind of keep your vitamin D levels where they are or raise them just by a few points. They don't do the best job. The sun doesn't alone doesn't do the best job of taking your vitamin D from a lower level and bringing that up into an optimal level. Um, so it, and again, there's a number of different factors that can also, um, impact whether or not your body is kind of in the optimal, um, optimal or is optimally absorbing, um, the kind of the sun and producing vitamin D from, from the sun too. So it depends on, you, you touched on a couple of them. So it depends on where you are, um, in relation to basically in, in relation to the sun, um, it also depends on what part of your body is exposed to the sun. Um, like, so if you're wearing a long sleeve shirt or um, if you have sunblock on, you're not going to be getting those vitamin D benefits um, from the sun. But we know some of those things are important for other reasons. But um, just vitamin D wise, you might not be um, kind of getting what you think are in the optimal way. Also, it depends on your skin pigmentation, your age, um, and then a lot of factors about you personally as well. Um, so it's interesting. So in terms of um, different ways that you can start to improve vitamin D, so you touched on, of course, the sun is one of them. So spending some time in the sun can be helpful um, to keep to keep you where you are. But really, if you are vitamin D deficient um, and your blood work indicates that you are, I would say the best way to start to improve that vitamin D level would be through supplementation. Um, so as a dietitian, I typically take a food first approach. If there are if there's a food that you can incorporate, um, I typically like to start there. Um, but so some foods do have vitamin D in them, um, certain fish, mushrooms, eggs, um, but it really is hard to get enough vitamin D just from food alone um, as well, because it, it, it is in smaller quantities. Um, I would also say that vitamin D is very well, the vitamin D supplement is very well absorbed by the body. Um, so I, I find that people do have great success um, once they start supplementing with the vitamin D supplement. Yeah. And would there be a, a recommended dosage in terms of supplementation? I mean, from what I've heard, it's it's very hard to overdose on vitamin D, but I would love to get uh, your expert opinion on how much dosage or what would be the recommended dosage for vitamin D. Uh, I guess that would be in international units, right? Yeah. So I would say um, basically the upper limit is 10,000 IUs per day. Um, so you definitely don't want to exceed 10,000 IUs, um, whether that's from a combination of different supplements or um, different foods that you're having, et cetera. Um, so typically what I recommend if someone's levels are deficient, um, I recommend starting with a 5,000 IU supplement. And um, if then with kind of the, re the, the beauty of repeat blood analysis is that you can see how your biomarkers are trending. So if your vitamin, if that's enough for your specific body to kind of get into that optimal zone and be where your vitamin D needs to be, then that's great. Um, if it needs to go up a little bit, um, then it can, you can adjust from there. So I typically recommend a 5,000 IU supplement with somebody who is vitamin D deficient. Great. And what would be that optimal range um, on a serum basis for vitamin D? Yeah. So we would say that for, um, it's interesting. So across, so a lot of the um, different optimal zones for biomarkers can differ based on age, gender, ethnicity, activity level, et cetera. Um, so it does kind of depend on your specific body, but um, I, I have your blood work pulled up here and for you, um, based yeah. on your, yeah, based on your age, gender, and all of the, like the factors that you have, um, I would say the optimal zone for you would be above 32. Um, but ideally we would want to see that above 50 too. Got it. So I'm about, I think 83 milligrams per deciliter. Um, I have it scrawled over here on the left <laughs> and, um, I do supplement with vitamin D, um, yeah. I, it's like I take a, a vitamin D kind of omega three kind of a, a complex, if you will, um, yeah. and uh, and that's it. I mean, seemingly working pretty well for me in terms of my levels. Um, I mean, I, I you know you touched on this very briefly, but what is the um, relationship between like melanin in your skin and your ability to absorb um, like UVB? rays that then might induce um vitamin d production endogenously because I, I find this to be pretty surprising and interesting 
Yeah. So I'm um, just kind of briefly touching on it. So when you have um, more melanin, I, I'm not sure of like the exact mechanism, but I know that like the more melanin you have, sometimes it can be, um, it can actually decrease the body's ability to absorb um, more of the vitamin D that you would get from the sun. So um, it's just kind of the differences in that skin pigmentation. Right. Yeah. Well, some of the, you know, there's so much data, um, both good data and, um, you know, curious data coming out, you know, during COVID about around vitamin D that really prompted a lot of people to, especially to uh, examine the relationship between vitamin D and the immune system. So I found it fascinating that, you know, our T cells and B cells, for example, which are primary immune cells, um, actually have vitamin D receptors on them. Um, so I was like, huh, that's interesting. Well, why? <laughs> Because uh, I'm like a, I'm like that annoying kid these days who just keeps <laughs> asking why, mom. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it, it seems that vitamin D helps to kind of upregulate the transcription of certain protein synthesis within these immune cells that are antibacterial or protective for the body. Um, so I just found that to be fascinating that there's this hormone that we've almost always associated with bone health but that seems to be so tied to the immune system. Um, and, you know, there seems to be pretty good data that show that, that higher levels of vitamin D provided some protection uh, against um, the more serious contraction of, uh, of COVID. So, um, you know, it doesn't seem like there would be anything wrong, at, at least with um, supplementing with vitamin D at the recommended dosages that you provide. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. And I think one of the most interesting points of the whole thing is that vitamin D is not typically included in a, in the blood work that a physician would do. Um, mm. it's something that would, is typically something that you would have to request as an add on. Um, so I think, I think it's interesting just because we see the rates of vitamin D deficiency are, are quite high at 40%. Um, and then if it's not, and we can see all of the immune benefits and benefits to other systems in the body, um, yet it's one of the biomarkers that, that seems to be overlooked uh, when it comes to physicians' blood work. So yeah. definitely Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously there's there's fantastic services like Inside Tracker, and, you know, I'm obviously a partner and a client. Um, but, you know, these are... Um, biomarkers that you can just ask your PCP for <laughs> and that they can run panels on, right? So it's just in, in some ways, it's being educated and taking agency and saying like, hey, you know, if you're going to do blood work at my annual exam, you know, check out my vitamin D. So definitely, right? Yeah, yeah. I would encourage everyone to get theirs checked. Cool. All right, let's talk about cortisol. Um, because it's so out there in the uh, in the zeitgeist, it's a word that gets thrown around all the time. It's widely uh, kind of famously renowned as the stress hormone. Um, but uh, can you unpack the nature of cortisol a little bit? It's it's positive attributes and it's detrimental attributes, and you know why is this an important biomarker? Yeah, definitely. Um, so you kind of nailed it there with the with the introduction to cortisol. So it's kind of coined the stress hormone. So you might have heard about it um, in times of when you're really stressed out. So basically, when the body's under any kind of stress, so whether that's mental stress, emotional stress, physical stress, the body reacts by deploying the hormone cortisol into the bloodstream. Basically, what that says to the body is we need to allocate energy to whatever the stressor is um, to keep this person alive, um, even if that means taking away energy from other processes in the body. Um, and so basically what that does, it gives you um, kind of, it kind of puts your body into that fight or flight response. So um, you can see how some cortisol would be so would be super helpful um, in times of actual stress. So let's say um, you're being chased by a bear or, um, or even if you're trying to, like, if you're trying to do a workout or something like that. So having that immediate energy can be beneficial. Um, and we know that sometimes, uh, stress can be also good stress. So, um, it's something the body is able to adapt to. Um, but over time, if your cortisol levels stay elevated, um, which can happen in, in periods of extreme stress, um, basically it's, it, it as a long-term solution, it's not, it's not really a great option. So, 
um, because, because of the energy being taken away from other processes. So just as an example, a couple of the processes that um, wouldn't be as necessary to your, like that your body wouldn't deem as necessary in a time of stress would be something like your immune system um, or your digestion or something like that. So these are processes that kind of take a backseat when your cortisol level is high, um, which is interesting because um, I think some people can maybe relate to this, but if they have kind of like a full week or you're studying for exams and you're really stressed out for a week and then you kind of come down with a cold. Um, after that. So it's kind of, it's an example of how um, having those elevated levels of cortisol are taking away energy from your immune system. It's kind of same with digestion. So, um, so we know that when you're, I mean, I'm sure everyone can kind of relate to this too, but when you're stressed out about something that you have to get like a knot in your stomach, um, maybe your digestion isn't kind of optimal that day or that week or whatever it may be. So um, we can see how it's, uh, having some cortisol is helpful in the short term. Like if you are, if you need that immediate energy, um, but over time we want to make sure that that one still goes back down into the optimal zone. Mm, yeah. There's so many good points there. So, uh, I think about digestion, for example, um, there's the old adage, you are what you eat, but, uh, I interviewed, um, this ultra endurance athlete last week, a guy named Tony Riddle, and he framed <laughs> it a little bit differently. He's actually, you are um, the nutrients that you can actually absorb. And, um, and that kind of struck a chord with me. Obviously we need nutrients for energy production and cellular respiration, um, et cetera. And as you point out, you know, cortisol is associated with the sympathetic nervous system or what is known as fight or flight. So your heartbeat increases, your breath rate generally increases. Sometimes your pupils will dilate, blood flows out to your extremities and your muscles because you're ready to fight that bear, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we're, you know, we live on the Serengeti of Facebook now, not really the Savannah <laughs> of, e of East Africa, but still, uh, that's a whole nother thing that we could get into. Um, but when you, the other side of the sympathetic nervous system is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is known famously as rest and digest. And so, you know, Cortisol is concomitant with fight or flight, but then there's a whole other set of hormones or neuromodulators that are associated with rest and digest. And so what I find is um, before one actually eats, you know, one of the reasons to say grace or to be, uh, to show gratitude for your food or to engage in a tiny bit of breath work that might invoke a more parasympathetic state is to actually enhance your ability to actually digest and absorb nutrients. So it's, it's interesting um, because as you say, chronic cortisol can lead, um, can really have detrimental impacts. It can raise your glucose levels. It gets awful for your, for your gut. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think so many of us are living in a state of heightened anxiety uh, right now and, you know, spending too much time on social media and getting triggered and, you know, in that cortisol infused state. So this is a really interesting one. So what would be the optimal range um, for cortisol uh, for, I, I suppose, someone like me, or, or I guess that would be the question, does it change over time, over lifespan? Yeah, so it would change over lifespan. So um, there, we see some differences um, in in terms of just kind of age, just because um, sometimes it can be sometimes some of that like that stress control and um, it, along with some of the other con control of other markers can uh, can start to decline with age. Um, so that's something that age can play a role in. Um, also, activity level also plays a role in cortisol levels as well. So we know that, um, again, so kind of like back to the example of when you're running or, or you need that immediate energy for a, like kind of like a physical activity, um, we can see the optimal zones changing a little bit for basically like the athletic population as well. Um, uh, I would say for you, it looks like your optimal zone here um, would be under that's under 16 uh, micrograms per deciliter. So basically that's taking, taking into account your specific habits there. Yeah, absolutely. So things that can help cortisol levels. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people, uh, hear about meditation or some forms of breath work because some forms can actually be focused on raising 
cortisol and epinephrine, if you want to actually invoke a state of alertness, sometimes I actually do like a hyperventilation kind of breath before I want to learn something because I want sort of that cortisol uh, focused alertness. Um, but most of the time I want to de-stress. Um, so what would you recommend in terms of kind of mitigating chronic cortisol um, levels? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think a lot of it kind of stems from um, kind of the habits that somebody already currently has or what could be potentially contributing to their elevated cortisol levels. And that's going to be different across different people. Um, so you mentioned a really great one was meditation. I would say um, that's something that I think that everyone can do. It's like it, it's, it costs nothing to sit and kind of um, sit down and, um, and try to focus, focus your mind and kind of rid it up of the other thoughts of things that are popping up throughout the day. Um, so I would say just kind of like as a general rule of thumb, meditation is a great one. Um, I would also say that it just kind of just depends on what um, other factors are going on with somebody. And um, so one of the things can be if someone is working out at really high levels, let's say they're even potentially overtraining, um, I would say a recommendation for them would be to implement a lower impact activity, something like swimming, yoga, something that would be a little bit more, um, I would say, easier on their body. And I think that can be one way to start to um, reduce cortisol levels. Um, again, another kind of a relationship uh, that cortisol has with another biomarker would be with magnesium. Um, so we know that, so we'll get to this in a bit, but magnesium is kind of that anti-stress mineral. Um, so actually, um, optimal levels of magnesium are associated with improvements in cortisol levels. Um, so if mm. someone is magnesium deficient, um, I would, and also has elevated cortisol, the first thing I would recommend is that they start to incorporate more magnesium rich foods. Um, so that can be another um, example of something that can be helpful there. Um, there's also a few supplements, different adaptogens, something like ashwagandha um, that can help with, with cortisol levels as well. Um, the research is pretty good there. Um, so a couple of different um, options in terms of interventions for cortisol levels. But again, I think a lot of it um, depends on the person, what's uniquely impacting their cortisol levels. And um, again, if there's any way to kind of, I know stress is inevitable in life, but if there's a way to kind of prevent that or like stop that from occurring in the first or prevent the, prevent it from occurring in the first place, um, that can be helpful as well. Yeah. I think you bring up a great point and we'll pull on that as we kind of go through these biomarkers, but many of these biomarkers are interrelated, right? They have, there's a relationship between them. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a natural, um, uh, there's a natural slope to cortisol levels throughout the day. You know, you want a certain amount of cortisol, um, but in the evening, you know, when you're ready to go to sleep and getting ready, you know, your body, if it's on a proper circadian rhythm, and that's a whole other thing in terms of optimizing your circadian rhythm. Um, and I've talked about that on the show before, but the importance of getting light, uh, blue light early in the morning and minimizing yep. blue light in the evening, for example. But, you know, as you move through the day and you get into the evening hours, um, you obviously want to, you know, hit that melatonin window um, and and get good sleep and your cortisol is naturally going to come down um, at that juncture. So hopefully, if you're, hopefully. If you're doing the right things. So, yeah. Um, so this is cool. Um Let's talk a little bit about cholesterol and we'll yep. unpack a couple different markers in the world of cholesterol. So LDL or low density lipoprotein has um, often been cast as the villain in the saga <laughs> of cardiovascular <laughs> disease. We don't necessarily have to attack that, um, that mythology um, here, but um, why are LDL levels important and, and what's a good range to be shooting for? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's, you also, um, yeah. So as you <laughs> kind of mentioned, your LDL cholesterol, um, is kind of known as that bad cholesterol, kind of the villain in the series. Um, it is important to have some LDL cholesterol though, um, because we know that cholesterol is an essential component of your cells, your hormones, um, your ability to digest, uh, specific foods. Um, the thing kind of like everything is it can be helpful for certain things, but the problem is when you have too much of it. 
Um, so when you have too much of LDL cholesterol, basically what that does is it starts to build up this plaque on your arterial walls. Um, your arteries are um, really important for being able to transport blood throughout your body from your heart to different organ systems, et cetera. So um, the problem is when LDL cholesterol is too high, um, your plaque starts to build up on your arterial walls. Basically, um, and this will have another correlation with, with inflammation, which we'll get to also later too. But basically when um, there's that plaque buildup, it triggers your inflammatory response within your body. Um, basically that increase in inflammation can actually um, uh, exacerbate the issue of that plaque buildup create more inflammation, and then it kind of um, narrows in your arterial walls. So you can imagine that if you have this much space um, for blood to be able to flow throughout. Um, it can easily kind of go through. There's not as many issues, but as that wall becomes more, more and more constricted due to that inflammation, um, it can be harder for blood to pass through, um, which can start to lead to heart health complications. Um, so that's the very high level of LDL cholesterol. Um, and we see in the data that higher levels of LDL cholesterol is correlated with um, poor outcomes with heart health, poor outcomes with longevity um, and lifespan, health span, um, et cetera. So um, that's a little bit of an overview of the LD of LDL cholesterol. Right. And I think it's important to note that, as you say, LDL and cholesterol in general is important for cell membrane pliancy or flexibility, bioavailab bioavailability of certain foods, um, production of other hormones. It's actually an antecedent, I think, to both cortisol and testosterone. Uh, and it is actually produced endogenously in your body. You make yes. LDL um, and your liver sends it out. And so it's a, um, it doesn't all come from saturated fat, but it's often associated with, or higher levels are often associated with a diet that's high in saturated fats, right? So that's correct. Yeah. So if you were going to um, really focus on reducing your LDL levels, what kind of changes might you make in diet? Yeah. So you touched on on one of them. So I think a lot of things also um, when it comes to LDL cholesterol is it, it is truly dependent on what your habits are at baseline. Um, so let's say you eat, eat red meat twice a month. Um, reducing the amount of red meat you're having is likely not going to make that large of a difference on your LDL cholesterol um, when you're already not consuming like too much of it or um, or something like that. So I would say it depends on what your current habits are um, in terms of what the recommendations uh, would be for you. Um, I would say just kind of generally speaking, um, if you're having a lot of saturated fat per day, so um, you know having like a red meat, a processed meat, a butter, a coconut oil like within each each day, then that would be somewhere that you could um, potentially start to swap some sources of saturated fat with something unsaturated. So a fatty fish or um, or use, or avocados or olive oil or nuts and seeds, like other different um, unsaturated fats that can uh, that can still kind of give you some of those benefits that we talked about. So with your hormones, with your cell membranes, et cetera, but with um, with kind of without that amount of saturated fat. But again, it definitely depends on how much you're consuming at that baseline. Um, another, I would say, of the top ways to start to improve cholesterol, I think it's often overlooked, um, but it's the importance of soluble fiber. Um, so basically, soluble mm. fiber is really, it's, it's a, one of the most under-consumed nutrients in the American diet too, which I think is really interesting um, because it can be beneficial for so many different um, aspects of your body. But um, when it comes to fiber, basically what it does is it blocks the absorption of cholesterol to your bloodstream right away. So um, something that can be helpful there too. So fiber rich foods would be um, like oats are really great and soluble fiber. Beans are also a great option. Um, and then some other uh, nuts and seeds can be good options there as well. Um, so I would say that fiber is a kind of an overlooked nutrient when it comes to improving cholesterol levels. Um, and something that I always wanna start with too is, okay, so what foods can we add in to start to improve a specific biomarker rather than let me take away all of your favorite foods. So um, I think it's important to kind of like build healthy, build healthful habits um, in terms of integrating new and exciting foods. Yeah. And then obviously the pharmaceutical um, solution to high levels of LDL has famously been statins. So right. I think statins are 
maybe the second most prescribed drug in the United States. Um, that metformin's probably up there too, so the diabetes drug. But okay. um, you know, at, at least from my uh, position or, or my opinion as a general acolyte here, <laughs> is that there's a lot of different things one can do um, to address high levels of LDL prior to taking a statin. Um, because essentially if you're taking a statin, you're shutting down all that endogenous creation of LDL. And like you pointed out when we started, there's actually some very potent, important uses of LDL in the body. Um, so, you know, this is why, you know, maybe you're going to, like you say, maybe, uh, experiment with a, maybe more plant focused, high fiber diet. Um, like you say, fiber can create that lattice work, um, in your small intestine to slow down the absorption of foods into your bloodstream. That's also really, really helpful around carbs and, and, and glucose absorption. So you're going to, with fiber, you're going to, you're going to mute or neuter some of those glucose spikes as well. So as you say, so people are so deficient in, in fiber and there's tons of dietary five ways to get great fiber um, so with like cruciferous vegetables and nuts and seeds and whole grains, um, et cetera. So, um, yeah, high fiber, you know, low glycemic, that's kind of my, my, my general diet right there. Yeah. Um, so the other thing I wanted to ask you about LDL before we move on to the quote unquote good cholesterol is that there are different kinds of LDL particles, right? Um, so there's these big fluffy ones that tend not to be um, too villainous because uh, they don't lodge in the uh, the endothelial wall there as much. But there's the the culprits seem to be more of these kind of small, dense LDL particles. Is there a way to um, kind of delineate between um, LDL particles when you're looking at tests? Yeah, so it's interesting. So the particle size um, can play a role. Um, so just like you said, um, the the size of them and then kind of the amount of them do play a role in terms of kind of that correlation with heart health. But um, I would say just when we look at the general data, what we see is that actually the particle size is highly correlated with the count, which is um, just kind of that basic measure mm -hmm. of LDL cholesterol. Um, so I would say if someone is looking to start to improve their cholesterol, Actually, having that count is, um, I think it's a great baseline to be able to use and start to improve. Um, and I would say particle size can be beneficial once you're trying to kind of dig, like really get into the weeds of things. But um, I would say on a general level, the because they're all because they are highly correlated, um, I would say that the count's a good place to start. Yeah. My LDL was actually a little bit high, which I was surprised because I'm pretty plant focused. So I was trying to think about, um, I do, uh, I'm on a 16-8 uh, kind of intermittent fasting, pro intermittent fasting protocol. Mm -hmm. So I often do break um, my fast with a probiotic coconut yogurt. So th that's the only place that I can really pinpoint sort of uh, a consumption of exogenous um, or saturated fat that might be spiking my LDL a little bit. So I Maybe I'll have to address that. It wasn't off the charts per se, um, but it was a little bit high and that was surprising to me when I got my results back. Yeah. So I would say um, it's interesting. So I think that with coconut products, I know that coconut oil itself is actually made up of 90% of like 90% of coconut oil is made up of saturated fats. So um, mm -hmm. I think, it, and it's so interesting because um, it was kind of once deemed as like this, like super, super food, like for your health and all these things. So, um, so I would say, yeah, that's, that's a place that actually does contribute more saturated fat than um, but potentially meet the eye. But yeah, it's your levels were also weren't um, weren't too high. So it was in that borderline high area kind of saying like, OK, maybe it's something to start to address, but um, wasn't wasn't too off the charts, like you said. Yeah, it wasn't awful. Uh, but I like to be in the optimal range every time I know. You know, I'm going. Um, <laughs> Okay, let's move over to um, high density lipoproteins or HDL, which is uh, often called the good cholesterol. So, what's up with this biomarker? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, so HDL, like you said, it's known as that good cholesterol. Basically what it does is it just scavenges through your blood. Um, it's picking up the bad cholesterol, which is that LDL cholesterol, um, and then taking it back to the liver so that it can get broken down um, and eliminated from the body. So um, HDL is important to, it's important to make sure that you have that optimized HDL cholesterol because it can start to uh, lower that LDL cholesterol um, as well. And basically what we see um, in the research is that HDL cholesterol is highly correlated with good heart health, um, also with longevity. So um, there are, there's, there's pretty good research to support HDL cholesterol. Cool. So I would say its main feature is that it can start to eliminate the bad cholesterol or the villain. Nice. And um, yeah, I guess to pull on that a little bit. So when LDL gets lodged in the arterial wall or the endothelium, um, it can get oxidized essentially through inflammation and then HDL in the best case scenario is like the sweeper, right? And it just like comes right. through, picks it up, takes it back to the liver, as you say, and, and then you can, um, and then you can get rid of it. And uh, it's only kind of when LDL, there's a whole process when that actually breaks down. And as you said before, LDL gets lodged, it can't be um, removed and then it turns into plaques and then it can, it can create blockages and that can lead to atherosclerosis and stroke and all of these different things. So HDL is super important to be able to move that through. Um, are there good uh, dietary sources of, of HDL? Um, so I would say the best, um, the best dietary interventions to start to improve HDL cholesterol or kind of raise that level um, would be through those um, unsaturated fats. So kind of, again, like what we were talking about with LDL cholesterol. Um, so a fatty fish um, is a really great option. It's rich in those omega-3s. It's rich in polyunsaturated fats. Um, that can actually help your HDL cholesterol. Um, similarly, avocados, um, olive oil, those and nuts and seeds, again, um, nuts and seeds are always kind of like the star of the show. But those, um, those are different foods that are rich in polyunsaturated fats that and monounsaturated fats as well, and omega threes that can start to improve that HDL cholesterol level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just having a little flax and chia and sprinkling it on like virtually anything, yeah, <laughs> is a great. <laughs> it's a great little habit to have, and it's so it's so cheap, and right. uh, it doesn't really negatively or that positively impact taste too much. So um, it's always great just to have some around. I always have random bags of walnuts um, and pistachios kind of strewn about in various backpacks and gym bags <laughs> and things like that. Um, yeah. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, there's little habits I think people can develop that, that can um, optimize this ratio. The other ratio I think that's interesting, and I know we won't really talk about triglycerides, but um, one ratio that I've read about as a good indication of heart health is this ratio between triglycerides and HDL. Um, and if you keep that below two, that seems to be a pretty good indicator of, of heart health as well. Is that right? Yeah, that can be because basically triglycerides are just kind of like that's, they're kind of like a storage form. So when you're eating um, calories basically in excess, um, that can all be stored in, and packaged as a triglyceride. Um, which then the body can then break down and use for energy if it needs to. So um, you said you do a 16-8 fast. So that would be an example of when you're fasting and you're not having or you're not consuming energy um, outside, basically that can start to break down some of those different like storage forms um, of energy. So yes, so to your point, um, that ratio is something that's important to look at because it's basically um, your HDL cholesterol, which is that good cholesterol in relation to what you have stored. So right. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect bridge into glucose. Yeah. Um, because as you say, if there's too much glucose sitting around in the blood, if it can't get ushered by insulin into the cell for energy production, there's a few things that can happen with it. And we'll actually discuss a few of those different things. But one of them is that it can be essentially stored as um, as fat, as triglycerides and adipose tissue, et cetera. And, and then when you're in a low glycemic or low blood glucose state, you can trigger lipolysis and that can burn some of those triglycerides for energy. And everyone talks about keto and ketosis and maybe we'll pull on that a little bit. But um, so what's up with glucose 
And then what is the actual marker? Um, because glucose levels can, you know, pendulum up and down. So what's the marker? Is it looking at fasting glucose or an average or um, help us understand what, what that means? Yeah, definitely. Um, so like you mentioned, glucose is basically the body's preferred source of fuel. So what it does is it kind of, it, it helps with that immediate energy. So um, it gives your body the energy to move, to function, um, to breathe, et cetera. So um, glucose is really important for basically just for overall function. Um, but having optimal glucose levels is important for performance. It's important for longevity um, and even just overall health. Um, and then also having optimal glucose levels. So right now we're talking about fasting blood glucose. So basically fasting blood glucose is a measure that you get um, after that 12 hour fast. So um, it's important to make sure that you, if you are measuring your fasting blood glucose to complete a 12 hour fast, because um, we can talk a little bit about how your blood glucose rises and, uh, and falls in response to different foods. But um, just generally speaking, if we're thinking about fasting blood glucose, um, having optimal levels of that is basically a great indicator of your energy metabolism, um, which is basically your body's ability to harvest energy from the foods that you're eating. And also optimal levels are important for um, just also with like with your insulin response. So just understanding how your insulin is able to take that blood glucose uh, or glucose from your blood, bring that into your cells, fuel those um, as well. So we can see um, blood glucose levels being elevated for also a number of different reasons. So we can talk on um, a little bit about like the dietary components of that. Um, but there's actually a lot of lifestyle factors that can contribute to elevated blood glucose levels as well. Um, so we know that that sleep is extremely important for your for your insulin response and your blood glucose levels. Um, so actually, even acute like acute and chronic sleep deprivation can actually lead to elevations in your blood glucose levels. Um, we know that blood glucose levels are hard, harder to control as you age. Um, so some of that some of that processes or, or the processes kind of um, decline with age. So something to always making make sure that you're um, kind of prioritizing too. Um, but we're, if we're thinking about basically just um, the response of blood glucose to what you're eating, so basically what happens is when um, it, it's it's not normal for it to rise and fall in response to a meal. So basically, when you have a meal, um, your blood glucose levels can can basically start to rise, and then in between your meals, they start to they start to fall a little bit. Um, so that's like kind of a normal um, a normal response to of, of your blood sugar, but um, it's interesting. So having those spikes um, and having those like spikes be pretty elevated is something that you'd want to avoid um, because over time, when you have those higher spikes and then like the the sharper declines, um, basically that can um, impair your blood glucose response and make your fasting blood glucose um, actually elevated over time, which is something that you certainly want to avoid. Yeah. So this has been a big one for me. Um, I wear a continuous glucose monitor here on my yeah. tricep. For, for those people watching on YouTube, um, you can see it. And um, that interfaces with an app, so I can actually um, try not to be too neurotic about uh, about refreshing <laughs> that too many times <laughs> because that can actually have a negative knock-on right. impact on my blood glucose levels because it could stimulate with cortisol. With, 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 yeah, excited. <laughs> But yeah, I try. Uh, I try not to to do it. Maybe just a few times a day, just to get a little window into it, and then also to experiment a little bit of like isolating and identifying particular foods, and then seeing, you know, if I'm susceptible to little spikes in relation to specific foods, and then that's pretty interesting. Um, but uh, but yeah, so the, the amount of people that are running like high blood sugar levels or high blood glucose levels it's just astounding i mean half the country in the united states is essentially pre-diabetic um, yeah. and then of course there's another 10 or 15 percent that are diabetic so um in, in the range of what has been considered normal just keeps moving up because right. society is essentially has pre-chronic disease or or, you know, stricken with some form of chronic disease, in this particular case, potentially diabetes. So, you know, when I start wearing my, my CGM, 
it was really amazing because I, I thought I was, you know, pretty healthy, but I was running fasting glucose levels, you know, 110, 120, 130. And then I was getting these spikes and I was like, wow, I, I really just need to pay attention to this. And over the course of about two to three months, you know, I got this into a place where I'm running like between 80, you know, around 80, basically, which is a decent um, fasting glucose level. And then, you know, I'll see, you know, crests and troughs and things like that. And, you know, it's natural to see some spikes, as you say, or, or not spikes, but some r increases, um, right. you know, after a meal. But, you know, yeah, I want to avoid those huge spikes. You know, all of a sudden you're up at like 220 um, milligrams per deciliter or something like that. You know, oddly, yeah. just as a side note, I found that I was experiencing spikes in association with going into the sauna. Yep. And this was kind of curious. Now, I didn't know if it was just kind of my sensor somewhat malfunctioning or whether or not I was getting so dehydrated in the sauna that my blood volume was going down. So my glucose concentration was going up. Um, I'm not sure I ever got completely to the bottom of it, but I, now I hydrate um, with a little electrolytes, you know, pretty significantly before I sauna and after I sauna to, to mitigate some of those spikes. And it seems like th that I've been able to address it with that. So anyways. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering how you feel about fasting glucose levels versus fasting insulin levels. I know that that's not a, a biomarker that we're discussing, but I, I somewhat see fasting insulin as almost upstream from fasting glucose. So I wonder if you could pull on that just for a second. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a really great point too. And I think um, being able to have kind of those optimal fasting insulin levels is so important because basically what that does, it's, it's that it, like you said, it's upstream. So it's, um, basically it's what is being, um, released from your beta cells and grabbing that blood or sorry, grabbing the blood or the glucose out of the blood, bringing that into the cells, um, which is super important because like you mentioned, um, when you have those blood glucose spikes, when you're up in the two hundreds, um, without without that kind of impaired insulin response um, that can be um, put you into a state of hyperglycemia and be um, a bit more detrimental to your health. So um, I think that it's definitely really important. It's actually a biomarker that we're looking to also add to the platform just because it is quite important. Yeah. I'm glad to hear you say that because I think, you know, my pancreas could be working overtime to produce a ton of insulin that's almost, um, you know, that's keeping my blood glucose levels in a range that seem acceptable, but over the long haul, that's not a good formula for success because my pancreas will be overworked. My cells be, start to become a little insulin resistant. Um, and, uh, and even though maybe in the short term, it looks like my glucose levels seem to be okay, they're, they're just going to keep going up if my if I'm producing too much insulin. Um, so this is a good segue into our next marker because uh, essentially if your glucose in, in your blood needs to go somewhere, something needs to happen to it. And there's a number of, of locations, obviously the best one being in your muscles or in your cells for energy production. Some of it can get stored as glycogen in your liver for sort of rainy day um, energy. Uh, as we discussed, some of it can get ushered into kind of triglycerides as stored fat, which also can be a good thing because, I mean, we don't live with the scarcity of winter the way we once did <laughs> as foragers. Uh, but right. as a, it used to be an adaptive advantage. Being fat was actually a good thing at one point because we knew that we were going to need to burn that fat. Now we can just, you know, go to the convenience store any old time. But there's another end, end product um, for glucose in the blood, and that's related to this next marker, which is called uh, hemoglobin A1C. So what is hemoglobin A1C? What does it measure, and why is it important? Yeah, definitely. Um, so like you mentioned, um, there's a number of different ways that glucose can get stored. Uh, when it comes to HbA1C, 
Um, it's basically another storage mechanism of your blood glucose. So basically um, with HbA1c, glucose can also bind to hemoglobin, which is within your red blood cells. Um, it's basically um, a good indicator of your long-term glucose, of your long-term glucose levels. Um, so your fasting blood glucose is a measure of your blood sugar over basically after that 12, 12 hour fast. Um, whereas your HbA1c is a good measure of your long-term um, blood glucose levels. We say about three to four months. It's basically the, the lifespan of that cell. Um, so basically we want to make sure that that biomarker is within the optimal zone as well. Um, we know that having elevated levels of HbA1c are associated again with kind of prediabetes and diabetes. Um, we also see that it's highly correlated with longevity and aging. So um, just because it is another kind of place for that blood glucose or that glucose to be stored, um, definitely something that uh, you want to make sure is it kind of in that optimal zone. Um, I think you you also touched on a really um, key point earlier when you were talking about blood glucose levels um, in terms of kind of how that optimal zone has been changing over time um, and kind of that normal zone or what a physician would consider clinically normal. Um, I think it's super interesting to bring up that point here as well. Um, so basically when you're looking at the normal zones are basically when you're, when you get your blood work done by a physician, um, your specific level will be compared to a normal zone or what would be normal within the population. But if we're thinking about kind of the population in the U.S. Um, and how the rate, the prevalence and insulence, incidence of diabetes is kind of rising, um, that's also, uh, we see that like that number changing and kind of going, becoming more elevated. Um, so you're not necessarily being compared to a healthy population, but you're being compared to the average population. Um, that's something that Inside Tracker's optimal zones um, are really trying to um, to be more stringent about, or um, kind of clue you in on where you, where your body should be um, optimally, not just normally. Um, so yeah, so we get so it's interesting. So it's like our optimal zones are quite, um, I would say they're quite strict um, when it comes to blood glucose levels and HbA one C levels. And mm -hmm. if you're right, yeah, it's like you're you could be, and I think you've probably experienced this with your levels, but you're like right on the line there. Um, I think part of that is yeah. that our optimal zones are so strict just because we know um, basically of where, you know, based on all of your inputs, what would be basically best case scenario for you and not just kind of what's um, related to the general population. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I really commend you for having these stringent um, uh, optimal ranges, because as you can say, what's normal can just shift with a ever sickening population. So, you know, let, let's shoot for optimal, really optimal um, on an objective basis and not just a subjective basis because we could basically drift off <laughs> forever, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and, uh, and, and we seem to be headed in, in that direction. Yeah, there's um, this binding of, uh, of glucose and protein basically um, in, in your blood um, has created these, these, um, really, uh, scary sounding, um, compounds called advanced glycation end products, which has an acronym of ages right. and it's, you know, <laughs> and it's directly connected to aging. Um, and, uh, these can be inflammatory agents essentially in your vascular system and can be related in some ways, like to markers that we talked about earlier, like LDL. So if you have too much too many ages, too much advanced glycation end products that are causing inflammation in your vascular system. Well, then that makes it, that gives LDL more opportunity to get lodged within your arterial walls. So all of these things, you know, are related. And that's why um, I'm into like functional medicine and systems biology that's looking at like how all of these different biomarkers or systems are working together in cooperation because you can't really separate them because once you separate them all you end up doing is addressing the specific symptom of that particular thing and not looking at the body as, as a as a whole functioning organism and an organism that's in constant relationship with its environment right. so you know this is a this is part of it so yeah i was on i was in the range in the optimal range or in a decent range with um with hemoglobin a a1c but probably there's there's some work i can do there um to get myself kind of more in the bullseye of the optimal range um 
Cool. So let's talk about testosterone. Um, this is always a hormone that gets a lot of attention for some obvious reasons. <laughs> it's uh, so associated with uh, um, sexual vibrancy, but there's a lot of other components to testosterone as well, which I hope you can help us understand. So why are testosterone levels so important? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's, it's interesting. So when you're, when, when I, I just anecdotally, when I'm consulting with, um, different people who are getting their blood work back, you see testosterone that it's below optimized. Um, that's definitely like the first thing that every male typically wants to talk about. So, um, I think it's super important. I think just for the reasons that you mentioned, um, but it's interesting. So optimal levels of testosterone are, um, important for other processes in the body too. Um, so basically what it does is it facilitates, um, the body's anabolic response basically what puts it into that muscle building phase. Um, so testosterone is important for stimulating the development of bone mass, um, muscle mass, um, and eventually muscle strength as well. Um, and then kind of putting your body into that anabolic response or an anabolic process, which is kind of in that building phase, um, can actually also help your body to speed up recovery um, when you're working out. So um, if you notice that when you're working out, um, your muscles become sore, um, having those optimal levels of testosterone is basically putting you into that building phase, which can help to expedite that process. Um, it can also play a role in red blood cell, um, red blood cell production, function, et cetera. So um, it's definitely something that is really important. It's also tied to so many other systems in the body as kind of like you mentioned, like just kind of if you're looking at health in the body as like a holistic picture, um, it's related to so many other things. So it's related to magnesium, it's related to vitamin D, um, it can even be, it could potentially be related to other things too. Um, so yeah, it's important for a ton of processes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there seems to be increasing attention spent on erectile dysfunction these days. ED has become more, uh, has seems to have more currency in the zeitgeist. Um, and then mood, as you say, and muscle loss. Um, but testosterone's not only um, a male hormone or important for for men, right? It does play a role in women for women too. Is that right? It does, yeah. So it actually can put a woman's body into that um, into that muscle building phase as well. So, um, which is important because when you're um, when you're working out, or even just kind of just. Also, like with um, age-related declines in, in your bone health and your muscle health and things, um, it's important for women, too, to have optimal levels of testosterone. So the ranges look a little bit different, but um, the functioning yeah. of it um, has some some similarities. Yeah, we hear more about sarcopenia as related to, to aging, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that people need to look at, particularly I'm 51, so spending more time thinking about it than I might have spent in my 20s and 30s. Um, so are, are there foods that can uh, help boost testosterone levels? Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, so actually, um, I would say just as like a blanket statement, um, if someone has low testosterone levels, I kind of want to know how how much food in total they're consuming throughout the day. Um, so we mm -hmm. can see actually that um, like just not consuming like enough calories to fuel you and to cover you from everything, all the calories that you're losing throughout or burning off throughout the day, um, is associated with lower levels of testosterone. Um, it's actually quite common that we see in some, in males who are intermittent fasting as well. So I would say if, um, if males are considering intermittent fasting, um, I would say to start by hopefully still including enough calories throughout the day to kind of sustain you first. Um, and then you can make changes from there, obviously, depending on how much you're consuming or what you're consuming. But um, I would say I would say just total caloric intake is probably one of the most um, interesting ways to make sure that your testosterone levels stay optimized. Um, and kind of like we were mentioning earlier when it came to when we were talking about fats and how dietary fats and cholesterol are important for your body, um, they're actually important for synthesizing um, it's important for, uh, t uh, for testosterone synthesis as well. So, um, I would say the next place to look would be healthy fats. So, um, that's really important for testosterone production as well. So I would say those are so like fatty um, fishes, that kind of yeah. thing. 
Yeah. yeah. So that you can see how fatty fish and nuts and seeds and beans come up all the time. But <laughs> yeah, olive, <laughs> yeah, olive oil, around. right? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, this is, yeah. Well, this is the the Mediterranean diet, somewhat. You know, um, with a little little trim. Uh, oysters always oh, come up. You know, too. I think it, um, as it relates to testosterone and um, ginger, I've heard uh, also in this conversation. Um, what yeah. about just straight supplementation, um, in, you know, out, outside of food? Is, is this something you would recommend? Yeah, I would say actually, so kind of back to the ashwagandha, um, there is some evidence to suggest that ashwagandha supplements can be um, beneficial for raising testosterone levels as well. Um, that's something that can potentially help. And then um, in terms of other supplementation, um, again, how everything is connected, I would say that if you are suboptimal in either vitamin D or suboptimal in magnesium, um, actually getting taking uh, supplements for um, for those two specific nutrients can actually also help your testosterone levels. But that would be if you are deficient in either vitamin D or magnesium. Um, so those are other two supplements that could indirectly um, start to improve testosterone. Um, it's also interesting that I think kind of like the like an under or, um, consensus before was that, oh, you need to work out a ton for your testosterone levels, or the more you work out, the more the higher your testosterone levels will be. Um, but it's actually interesting that also overtraining or working out at really high levels is actually associated with lower levels of testosterone. Um, so it's another one of those factors where um, sometimes it's like more isn't always better. So um, if your testosterone levels are low and you're more sedentary, starting to work out and exercise and strength train or um, doing any kind of resistance training can start to increase your levels. Um, but we also see a, a lower levels of testosterone in those who are overtraining as well. Mm, that's so interesting and, and unexpected. Yeah, it's definitely something that I, I need to think about it. Like I mentioned, I do uh, intermittent fast. I, um, I probably err on the side of not getting enough calories, honestly. Um, you know, I'll go through a week where I'm, I'm maybe getting 800 to 1,000 calories a day. It's probably below um, what I would normally be recommended. So, you know, it's definitely something that, I, that I'm watching. Um, I'm sort of tweaking and experimenting on myself <laughs> quite a bit uh, and seeing like how I respond, you know, to different diet and different fasting regimes and hydrotherapy and all the different kinds of things that I think are going around right now, adversity, memetics and all that stuff, seeing, seeing kind of how my body reacts to a lot of these different things. So, um, and then the cool thing about, um, you know, getting your, your biomarkers and, and, and doing these blood panels, like you say, if you do it, you know, quarterly, let's say four times a year, then, you know, it really does give you a window into like, okay, what different, what praxis and dietary regimes are having, you know, what effects and, you know, what are the things that I want to tweak um, to kind of optimize my vehicle again. So it's, it's very cool. Um, you bring up magnesium, you brought it up a number of times. It, I think magnesium is sort of stepping center stage over maybe the last year or so. I just hear more about it as a essential um, mineral. And I suppose it's also an electrolyte too. So tell us a little bit about magnesium. Why are magnesium levels important? What role does magnesium play in the body? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. And, um, it's been brought up a number of times, I think, because it also just plays so many different roles in your body. Um, so basically we, um, our nickname for magnesium is the anti-stress mineral. Basically what it does is it helps to calm your nerves. Um, it helps to re relax your muscles. Um, and all, and because of those two different factors, it can play a role in a number of different processes. Um, so you might've heard of magnesium more recently because of its importance with sleep. Um, so basically, um, magnesium helps to put your body into that state of, re of relaxation. Um, and also more, um, having optimal levels of magnesium is associated with being able to produce melatonin, um, which is kind of that, um, that hormone, like you mentioned, that makes you sleepy if you have that, um, optimal circadian rhythms, of course. Um, so Basically, um, it's it's related to that. Um, it's interesting. So, mag optimal magnesium levels are also associated with um, basically optimal blood pressure, 
It can be beneficial for blood glucose regulation as well. Um, it can be helpful for testosterone production. So, so many different processes in the body. Um, and it's so interesting that you said that you've like started to hear about magnesium more and more often um, kind of recently. Um, it's interesting when we looked at our own inside tracker customer data, it was really interesting that magnesium was actually the biomarker that um, had the highest uh, rate of improvement between um, between 2020 and 2021. And I was kind of speculating like, okay, so what, what about magnesium? Um, are people starting to gravitate towards that? That was like such an improved biomarker um, over that past year. And I think because it's kind of that anti-stress mineral, I think um, just speculating, but during a stressful year, if you hear about an anti-stress mineral, maybe it's kind of more popular. So yeah, and it's pretty bioavailable. Um, it's not like a resveratrol or, or you know, an, an NMN or something kind of more of a bespoke, expensive supplement that, that you might be seeking out. You know, you can really access magnesium, right, as in supplement form, but it's also pretty bioavailable in food, right? Definitely. Yeah. And I think um, because it's in so many different foods and so many different types of foods, I think that kind of makes it surprising that it's um, a, um, a mineral that a lot of people are deficient in. But yeah, you can get adequate magnesium from pumpkin seeds, black beans. Um, it's actually in quinoa, it's in salmon. So you can see how it kind of, in you know, fruits and vegetables, it's, it ranges so many different types of foods that I think it's kind of surprising that um, people are quite deficient in it. But um, to your point also, it's, it is bioavailable and we see good, good results with supplementation of magnesium as well. Mm -hmm. Also for the chocolate lovers, I think you can find a little bit oh, of yeah. magnesium in chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did I leave that one out? Yeah. That's it. <laughs> it is a great way to get magnesium. <laughs> yeah. But not too much. Um, cool. All right. So inflama inflammation, you know, inflammation is upstream of so many diseases. Um, and one of the principal markers for inflammation is C-reactive protein. So let's talk about this particular uh, biomarker. Yeah. So basically with C-reactive protein, um, it's a very like general marker of inflammation. So we can see it being elevated for a number of different reasons or different ways that um, Basically, that it's, it's basically that's non-specific. So, um, if you can think about inflammation in a couple of different ways, so inflammation occurs um, if you're sick, um, if you let's say you roll an ankle, or it, again, kind of back to the example earlier with LDL cholesterol, if you have that plaque buildup in your arteries. So, um, CRP is kind of it's non-specific in that way that it can ele be elevated due to a number of different processes or different factors basically in the body. Um, but so I can kind of go through that mechanism a little bit. So basically when it comes to your immune system, um, so when you basically, when the body detects a pathogen or, or anything that shouldn't be there, whether that's damaged muscle cells or, um, or that plaque or the L, like excess LDL cholesterol or, um, or like a bacteria or something, if you're sick, um, the body's first response is to recruit white blood cells. Basically white blood cells are supposed to grab that pathogen, get rid of it from your body. But what that does is it triggers your inflammatory response. Um, so your capillaries are dilating. And um, it basically, the whole point there is to be able to localize that pathogen, keep it where it is, and prevent it from spreading to the rest of the body. Um, so we can see how that's super um, beneficial for your body when um, you have a pathogen or something that shouldn't be there because it doesn't, it helps, to, it helps you to basically recover quicker because it doesn't spread to the rest of your body. Um, but actually, over time, you don't want um, levels of inflammation to stay elevated um, because it's basically kind of um, putting your like altering your immune system and kind of setting you up like like how we talked with um, with like the constriction of your arteries or different things. Um, you don't want inflammation to be long term or chronic, um, but we can see how it can be beneficial short term. Yeah, I think that's really helpful for people to understand because uh, inflammation in an acute sense is very, very helpful from just, you know, I've got three girls and they're falling down and, and skinning their knee and I'm very happy for inflammation to, you know, live in the neighborhood. <laughs> and as you say, deploy white blood cells and start a healing process and angiogenesis in the right way. Um, 
but when you, you know, the sensations oriented with inflammation, like redness, itchiness, uh, pain, heat, um, if you think about those things, it becomes quite clear that you don't want that chronically in your vascular system, right? right. <laughs> or, or any, or anywhere really chronically. And, um, you know, chronic inflammation has been, uh, highly associated, for example, with intestinal permeability or leaky gut. So when you, when the epithelial wall, uh, between your colon and your bloodstream breaks down and endotoxins and lipopolysaccharides start to like flow into your bloodstream from, you know, your colon. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, your immune system does what it's supposed to do. And it's, it, 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 you know, it sends out, um, it, it, it triggers an inflammatory response. Um, but if you have that kind of breakage, for example, in the wall of, of, of your epithelium in your gut, and you've got, you know, endotoxins flowing in there all of the time, and your immune system is in a constant state of agitation, and then all of a sudden your chronic inflammation, um, this is a, this is not a recipe for success. <laughs> um, and that can, as we talked about, can be upstream for a lot of different of these chronic diseases that we see that are, you know, on the, on the ever, um, efflorescence in our society. So this is, a, I think, a very um, important, um, but very broad marker. Um, but there's a lot that we can do um, to mitigate inflammation, right? So maybe we can start with diet and then move from there. You know, is there a particular kind of anti-inflammatory diet that we should be looking at? Yeah, I think um, basically the whole, I think anti-inflammatory kind of became a buzzword, but um, there are a number of things that we can do um, nutrition wise to kind of set us up for success when it comes to inflammation. Um, so something I always like to talk about when it comes to RHS CRP levels is actually, so um, we know that even more than 70% of our immune system was within our gut. Um, so actually being able to optimize our gut microbiome can actually help to help to mitigate um, inflammation levels and also to um, kind of prevent that in the first place. So something I like to talk about with um, HSCRP is making sure that you're getting enough prebiotic and then probiotic rich foods. Um, so we're going to see fiber rich foods come back up again, um, which are the prebiotic foods. Basically what that does is it, um, is it helps to produce those short chain fatty acids within your gut microbiome, um, which increases the diversity and abundance of your gut, so of your gut bacteria. So that can be one really great way um, to, to kind of take a preventative approach to um, inflammation. Something that is also beneficial there is probiotic rich foods. Um, so you've likely heard of kind of, of yogurt and of helping your immune system, or if someone, uh, you might've heard someone say like, oh, if you're on this antibiotic, you should have a yogurt each day. Um, basically what that does is it helps to, um, it's kind of those live cultures. It helps to increase again the abundance of your gut bacteria. Um, can also be helpful for inflammation levels. Um, so those are two like great places I would say to start. Um, also, that is, things that can be beneficial for inflammation levels are polyphenol rich foods. So polyphenols are a specific type of antioxidant. Um, basically, antioxidants are helpful for limiting the damage of free radicals. Um, which can start to damage your different cells and increase inflammation. Um, so polyphenol rich foods are important there. Um, berries are a great example. Chocolate's also a great example there. Um, and coffee and tea can be um, other just polyphenol rich beverages as well. Um, so I would say those are um, a few good places to start with foods for inflammation. Yeah, in my pack of walnuts, I generally have a couple handfuls of blueberries in there, obviously very famous for their antioxidant um, properties. Uh, green tea with EGCG, it's kind of famously good for this, but avocados and broccoli and other cruciferi and again, fatty fish and peppers and mushrooms. Um, and like you say, fiber, uh, so key because as you say, prebiotic fiber, basically the 39 trillion bugs in your gut have to eat something. Um, and what they eat is prebiotics or fiber. And when you feed them good fiber, uh, they'll create um, postbiotics, essentially short chain fatty acids and other metabolites that actually um, ensure 
the integrity of that epithelial wall so you don't get that seepage of endotoxins into your bloodstream. So it's 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 prohibiting inf- inflammation kind of at its source. So I'm all I'm all fiber all the way. And then here here at home, we're fermenting quite a bit. So we we do our own sauerkraut here, which is obviously a live bacteria. So you're getting the probiotic, uh, you know, the the different, um, I think primarily lactobacillus plantarum in that particular case. But, you know, so you're getting the probiotic there, but you're also getting the prebiotic fiber with the, with the cabbage um, itself. And then you're also getting some postbiotics because there's a whole fermentation process happening within the crock. So it's, it's a great food yeah. and fermented soys all sorts of fermented soys, tempeh, and um, other things are, are are pretty good and uh, and delicious and ways to integrate. But and then of course there's things that you really want to avoid. So maybe you could kind of just check off the list of what might be considered an inflammatory food. Yeah. So actually, it's interesting. So kind of back to the examples um, that we talked about with LDL cholesterol. Um, actually, saturated fat rich foods can be inflammatory. Um, so that would be one thing. Also processed foods can be inflammatory as well. So we or um, so I would say processed foods that are, um, basically that don't add nutrient value. So, um, something like a soda or, um, other, yeah, uh, like something that's more yeah, processed, like processed, like processed meat, meat or something. And things. Yeah. 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 Um, I would say those are more inflammatory foods right? just because they don't really provide yeah, I mean, any of that nutrient value. Right. I was just trying to avoid the refined added sugars, which, um, you know, are so insidious because you don't even know that they're in there <laughs> most of the time. And if you go in the grocery store, I think all the center aisles, there's like 84% of those foods have some form of added refined sugar um, to them. And, the, you know, your, your bad gut bugs love the sugar. Um, but your good bug, gut bugs don't. So, and, and then there's this kind of omega-6, omega-3 deal. So sometimes too many omega-6s um, in your diet, I think can can be inflammatory. And then of course, trans fats, which are just always to be avoided basically. <laughs> um, um, cool. So we're almost there. Um, this is number 10 biomarker and it's just such a thrill uh, to talk with, with you about it. Cause this is an area where I have so much curiosity just in bio, around biomarkers and, um, kind of taking more agency over my own health and, you know, just becoming more, as my friend Mark Hyman says, becoming the CEO of my own healthcare <laughs> in some fashion. So, uh, so this is a marker called ferritin and, um, most people won't recognize it by its name, um, but what is ferritin and why is it an important marker? Yeah, that's a great, great point. So last but not least, we have ferritin. Um, so ferritin is basically a protein in your body that is storing iron. Um, so you've likely um, heard of iron and your uh, and iron uh, blood levels of iron are more of like a recent measure of your um, iron levels, how much is in your blood um, based on what you're eating and supplementing with, et cetera. Ferritin really gets at kind of that storage form. So um, how much overall is available for your body, not just what's specifically in your blood. Um, So iron is really important for a ton of different processes in the body. Um, I would say most notably, um, its ability to carry oxygen um, throughout the body. And basically what iron does carries oxygen and delivers it to your cells. Um, So we know that a lot of different processes and activities require oxygen. Um, so when you're working out, you can kind of think about how that would be important to be able to bring oxygen to your cells and fuel your activity and what you're actually doing. Um, iron's also important for just basically like others um, function. So it's important for your nervous system. Um, it's important for immune health, um, a few different things. So it's interesting. So ferritin can be um, a good measure of that. It's like, again, it's kind of that longer term measure. So the way we talked about blood glucose levels in comparison to HbA1c, um, similarly, iron versus ferritin. Um, there's a number of different things that can lead to kind of like the decline of ferritin too, um, which is why I would say it's it's really important to make sure that you're measuring too, because 
um, it can it can directly impact also how you're feeling. So low levels of ferritin are associated with a decrease in energy um, in kind of more of that fatigue and um, it can make you feel dizzy, things like that. So um, ferritin is definitely important to, to optimize. There's also certain groups that are at a higher risk of having unoptimized uh, ferritin levels. So um, I would say kind of the premenopausal woman um, who is, if she's menstruating, losing blood um, each month, then that would put somebody at a greater risk of having lower levels of ferritin. Um, we also see low ferritin levels in people who are quite active. Um, so basically kind of the, the thought there is that like that foot strike is breaking up your iron, um, which can um, make that one basically trickier to have uh, like optimal levels of, of ferritin there. Um, it's also harder for your body to absorb. So I call, I tend to call iron kind of a high maintenance mineral. So basically it requires this like perfect environment to be able to move into that, um, to that storage form, which is ferritin. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't like to be taken um, with a lot of food, doesn't like to be taken around inflammation or exercise. So um, for a few different reasons, we see that ferritin is, tends to be suboptimal. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, and, and you really, it seems as if you really want to find that Goldilocks zone with ferritin, because as you say, low ferritin levels could point to like anemia or low energy. Um, obviously, as you point out, oxygen is essential to energy production, cellular re respiration. I think it's like that final electron receptor of the electron transport chain. It's like in your mitochondria that's pushing the very edges of <laughs> my, bio <laughs> my biology there. Um, but in that production of ATP right at the end, oxygen obviously plays a, a, a very key role. And this is why we have humans make so much energy we're prolific because we have aerobic res respiration if we're anaerobic then we're just making energy through fermentation and sometimes we do that and when we're not getting enough oxygen um and we're exercising sometimes our muscles get kind of sour and sore because we're not getting enough oxygen because we're making energy through fermentation and not through um aerobic um cellular respiration so that was always an interesting aha moment when I, when I learned about that. But then on the other side, you could have high ferritin levels, which um, you know could could point to hyperthyroidism or liver disease or, or other things. So it's really just like everything in life, you know, you got to find that Goldilocks zone, right? Right. Um, and this is just not a, a a marker that I think people are that used to checking in on. I totally agree. Yeah. I think, um, yeah. And I think it's one of the ones that again, like you don't hear about as often, so it can be triggered to know like not even what, what it is, but like what your level is, or if you've ever even had it tested before. Um, so I agree. It's, it's super important. It's also like a really great example of why kind of blind supplementation isn't always a good idea. Um, so I mentioned a couple of the, like, I would say the populations that are, um, at a higher risk of having low ferritin levels. Um, but to your point, uh, more isn't always better, especially when it comes to ferritin. So you definitely don't want ferritin to kind of exceed that optimal zone range because that can also be detrimental to your health. Um, so it's also just kind of a great, um, a great way to show the importance of knowing what your level is to know exactly what your intervention should be, whether that um, is a supplement or you can get enough through food or if you have too high of levels, you need to cut back on something. Yeah, what is, is it, a market micrograms per liter is that the for the measurement do you know the uh i, I don't remember what the optimal range is for ferritin <laughs> yeah so it's actually nanograms per milliliter um for ferritin but yeah so it's interesting so in this one i would say i i think the optimal zone for ferritin i would say varies the most um the, uh, of all the biomarkers that we test for at inside tracker um based on based on all of your uh, unique inputs so Women will have a very different optimal zone than men. Um, highly active individuals will have a, will have a difference there as well. Um, so I would say that is one that also um, changes a lot. I would also say that's the biomarker that um, our optimal zone differs from what a physician would consider clinically normal. Um, I believe a physician considers clinically normal ferritin levels at 12 um, nanograms per milliliter, which is quite low. If someone is at... Um, 
is even below 30, I'm it's, it can, it, that's quite low. So, um, so I think it, I would say that's probably like the biomarker that has quite a discrepancy between what's considered optimal versus normal. Yeah. And in terms of, uh, exogenous sources of, um, of iron, I suppose, well, you know, what would you be looking to if your, if your levels are low, what would you be looking to in terms of food to add to your diet? Yeah. So I would say, um, so there's, um, heme iron, which is found in animal rich foods and then non heme iron, um, which is found in plant-based foods. So, um, I would say depending on what your cholesterol levels are, um, that could start mm. to, um, inform which sources of iron that you, um, that would be best to consume. So I would say if someone has elevated cholesterol levels, but also low ferritin levels, um, to kind of opt for a plant-based source of iron. So that would be things like beans, um, lentils are a great option. Um, spinach is an option as well. Um, so I would say to start there. Yeah, that's a great point, you know, for people basically who are either high or running high LDL levels and want to cut down on their saturated fats and cut down on their animal meats, then there's really good sources, um, essentially vegetarian sources, which is great. And then I think, um, but for folks, um, that need that heme iron, um, that have, acceptable levels of LDL, I think you're going to say that, that, that there's sources around animal protein that, that, that are available there. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. So then I would say in those cases that red meat can be an option, um, types of seafood can be an option as well. Um, one way to also best absorb iron is to pair it with a food that's uh, rich in vitamin C. Basically, vitamin C mm. just helps to increase the absorption of iron. Um, which is beneficial, can help your ferritin levels as well. So um, vitamin C would be like bell peppers, berries, um, lemon, um, a few different things. Oh, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, I love um, doing a very simple sautéed spinach and then squeezing some lemon juice on top of it with like a, a mineral, like a sea salt or a rock salt. That for me, that's just like so delicious. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's uh, so simple and so great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's interesting. I didn't know because like curcumin or turmeric is activated through bell, through um, black pepper, um, which is an interesting um, phenomenon. So great to know that ascorbic acid essentially upgrades the bioavailability of iron in, um, in foods. So that's awesome. That's a great tip. That's a great tip. I love it. So Michelle, this has been so amazing um you really you sherpaed us through you know these uh incredible a whole such a wide range um of biomarkers and i know that people are just going to find this to be uh incredibly illuminating and also very actionable um and yeah you know i guess i would just want to ask you more as a general observation you know how personalized uh, medicine and, uh, and, and these kinds of tools like inside tracker, or I wear like an aura ring or, you know, in a, in a continuous glucose monitor, you know, what are your thoughts more generally about how, um, technology and tools can really, um, play a role in individualized kind of personalized medicine? Yeah, it's a really great question. And it's something that I've been thinking a lot about recently as well. So um, I think the, like having the ability to track all of your data, I think is um, is so important. I think being able to track your data over time, whether it's with your sleep or your with this through your aura or um, your blood analysis through Inside Tracker or um, through a continuous glucose monitor, I think basically having all of your data is a really great way to kind of understanding how your body is functioning. Um, but what I really think is important there and kind of gets into the personalized nutrition and personalized wellness space is really kind of like the what next. So I think it's really important to be able to track all of your data, but, um, I think something that's really important is being able to empower people to make different health decisions based on what they're seeing in their data. Um, I think it's something that's, it's a really important component. And I think, um, kind of like you mentioned, you like, you check your blood glucose levels in your, um, in your app a couple of times a day and you, you will want to see like what specific foods are, um, are spiking or like having a more of an increase than another food. Um, again, I think the data is really important, but I think also the, what comes next is also important. So, okay. So if you see that that specific food, um, uh, for you is raising your blood glucose, maybe it's something that you don't have as often. So, um, 
I think data and technology play a huge role in health. And I think especially um, we're seeing that more and more now. Um, but I think also the action and the behavior change is such a critical component of it as well. I think that's just such an astute point. And they're very related. Like I didn't take my actions or behaviors very seriously until I actually understood mechanism. So yeah. now what I think is the holy grail is this marriage or elixir of mechanism and praxis or mechanism and modality. Um, so it's partially about, okay, now I understand uh, the process, the system, and I can do something very specific uh, to address that particular mechanism. And so, I, you know, this is a, this is a brave new world. And, you know, I love what, I love what you're doing. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a probably a big educational course in it, um, that I'd love to talk to you about sometime, because I think, you know, as people understand these mechanisms and these markers in their own life, it's going to give them so much empowerment. Um, to then, as you say, adopt the behaviors next. And um, and the more that we can do that, the more we can um, not only just take care and optimize our own personal health, but what does that mean to the community of people that we're around? If I'm feeling healthy and energized, what does that mean to my society if I'm not sucking down huge insurance payments or you know being basically more or less, uh, you know, living with this cocktail of comorbidities for 20 years, essentially, you know, we have a, we have a $4 trillion, essentially treatment care business or sick care, um, business. What we need is more actual health care. Um, and I think what you're doing is addresses that head on. So Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, of course. I think I agree with all of that. I think it's, yeah, it's so important. I think having that knowledge is, is really important. So it can help you empower yourself and empower your health. So I definitely agree. Nice. Thanks, Michelle. We'll do it again. We'll, we'll, ta we'll tackle the next 10 next time. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> thanks so right. much. To be, con to be continued then. Perfect. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this interview from the Commune Podcast, then click subscribe and check out this video right here.